Good afternoon and welcome to episode five of the Business of Business podcast. As a reminder, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, so please take a few minutes to download and rate the podcast. It'll make it easier for others to find. You can also sign up for our newsletter at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast.com. Today we have a very interesting guest, Beth Cody. She is going to talk to us about mastermind groups, and I don't have a lot of knowledge of this, so this is going to be very uh, informative for me as well. Uh, mastermind groups actually give professionals a chance to uh, maximize their time and earning potential with clients, and uh, I don't want to make any missteps, so instead of me talking around what I know. Uh, Beth, I just want to go ahead and introduce you, and uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got here, and then we can uh, uh, get into the part about mastermind groups. Sure. Thank you, Roy. Um, so my name is Beth Cody, and I've been in the digital marketing space for seven years, uh, going on eight years. I actually started uh, making websites for local businesses because when I was in college I needed extra money, but I did not want to flip burgers. <laughs> yeah, don't we, I, I was are. not. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I I finagled my way out of having to work at McDonald's uh, part time. So I started off making websites with just basic templates for people, um, and uh, I already knew a little bit about uh, basic coding. And over the years, uh, I just kept doing that, kept freelancing on the side for a long time. Uh, and as my clients' demands grew, so did what I had to learn in order to meet those demands. Uh, so then it became less about just a website presence and more the marketing, like email marketing, um, Facebook ads, uh, content marketing, copywriting. Uh, eventually, I kind of became a one-stop shop for marketing um for my clients but uh, that became exhausting so over the past uh a little over a year i was actually working uh with a client on a mastermind program <clears throat> and his he had a, already a, a great following of uh people in his uh, you know, Facebook community, uh, he had a list. So he, he was already established and had people who knew, like, and trusted him. And that's uh, a really important thing when you're in business is to have people who already feel like they know you personally. Um, so then uh, he decided he wanted my help to create a mastermind program for students because they were really asking for one-on-one, -on -one, but he didn't have the capability to take on 30 people on a one-on-one -on -one setting, it would have completely eaten up his week and um, kept him from doing uh, what his business was teaching these students to do, which was real estate. So he would <laughs> basically have had to give up the whole purpose of his business just to coach other people how to do that. So it would have taken far too much time. Uh, so we had fantastic success with that program, and I decided that that is uh, the focus that I want to put on my own business now. And so... Um, now I help other professionals who are overwhelmed by the, the response and the demands for one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions, and they're looking for a way to make that same kind of higher income, but without having to sacrifice so much of their time and energy into it. And instead of having to spend maybe 20 to 30 hours on private coaching sessions a week, uh, they're able to just have one session maybe on the weekend for a couple of hours and reach even more people without exhausting themselves, without having to spend a lot more time and money. So that is essentially what I do, and that's how I've evolved my business from doing very basic websites years and years ago up until now. Okay, that sounds cool. Now, the these mastermind groups, I, I see a lot more of them now. Is this a pretty new phenomenon, or has this been around for a while, but it's just becoming more prevalent? I, I believe it's been around for a while, but, yeah, it definitely in the marketing space, people are really looking 
to online courses are becoming really the bread and butter for most marketers um, because they're so easy. They're easy to create, even if you don't have uh, a system like the system that I learned from my mentor. Um, even if you don't have a specific system of doing it, most people can figure out how to break something down into steps from point and get you know somebody from point A to point C. Uh, and online courses, really, it's kind of a, for the most part, it's a one and done depending on the level of online course. Uh, you know, I have lower level courses that are maybe five video lessons. That's pretty easy depending on how long they are. You could knock that out in like two hours. But when you're doing a mastermind, that is a little more, I, I would say a little, that's a lot more involved. But it is kind of the same concept. We're breaking down these complicated concepts that people really don't feel like they can attain into easy steps that they can then use and they can have instant wins. And that's really the big thing about masterminds and inner circle programs as well and just these higher ticket courses is you, your students need to feel like they are always succeeding all the time. Uh, that's really the big, uh, the big key to having any kind of success in that space. Yeah, and I guess the real value is that ongoing support that I'm not just reading uh, a lesson on a piece of paper, but from what I understand, uh, like you said, these groups may have a, a session once a week or once every other week where everybody can come together and I guess in the in the meantime they're able to post questions uh, and maybe getting a little ahead of myself but they're able to post questions to the group and have group interaction so but let me step back just a minute and say um, so how do you set these up I, I think I understand that they are like a like a closed LinkedIn group I mean a closed Facebook type group but could you kind of explain the mechanics of how that works sure so yeah you're exactly right there is a, a Facebook community aspect to uh, to the program that I helped set up and it's it's really important that's a that's a huge a huge part of it because like you said the students need to be able to interact with each other and also when you have students who are coming in who are new but then you have students who are established who have been doing the mastermind for a while it does actually save you time and effort to have these, you know, maybe five or 10 people who are already very experienced helping to answer the questions for you. And that, again, this is the way that we're cutting down on our time, uh, the time that we're having to spend. Now, granted, you're still going to need to interact, of course, uh, with your Facebook community, um, with your, your private Facebook mastermind group. But when you have people who are already just incredibly jazzed about what you do. They've had success. They understand the concepts. When you have more than just you in there helping them out, that's huge. That's incredibly important. So yes, we have the <clears throat> the Facebook group, um, and then we have a separate course area that we set up. And there's a lot of different programs we can use. It's really based on uh, client preference. Uh, I've done it with uh, ClickFunnels. It's very popular. Uh, I've done it with an Entreport plugin to a Words, uh, WordPress website. Uh, Entreport is a customer relations manager. Um, and ClickFunnels is a uh, funnel builder that also has a capability for uh, creating very simple online courses. It doesn't need to be fancy. Uh, but if you do want something a little fancier with a little more interactive features, there's also things like... Um, Thinkific. Thinkific is very intuitive. It's a, it's a really lovely program. It's my preference uh, because you can also make sure your students aren't just skimming over and moving on. You can have things like quizzes that kind of force them to remember what they've learned so they really truly understand those concepts. Um, and then we also uh, have a design team and our design team does uh, not only the overall course design, but we also do worksheets. Worksheets are, uh, and those supplemental course materials are something that I learned from my mentor, uh, Dan Henry. And if anybody wants to learn how to make a, uh, an online course, um, I highly recommend Dan Henry for that. Um, he's who I learned from. And he really reiterated worksheets are also a fantastic way to cut down on your uh, refund rates. Um, 
one thing that we do is we make sure people understand that uh, they have to do the work if they want their money back. So they can't just, you know, not do anything. And then, <laughs> and then be like, well, if I want my money back, you know, it didn't work for me. Well, you didn't do the work. So that's, that's a big thing, uh, especially in these higher level courses. Um, you really don't want people just kind of skipping out because they got bored. You really need them to be interactive. You need them to be engaged. And the worksheets aren't just busy work. The worksheets, they're, they're such a huge part of the process. You really need them to keep people, like I said, interactive, engaged, but also it gives them something tangible to fill out. And for a lot of people, uh, based on uh, what something that I've come across uh, in the learning space called the cone of learning, so many people really learn better not just by listening or watching a video, but really when they're interacting and doing. So by having worksheets that are having them fill out um, with their hands, uh, you, you can, of course, do online, you know, fillable PDFs, but I don't recommend it because it's very easy to just kind of blow through it. I really recommend encouraging people to write it with their hands. Um, you're getting people then involved in the process, and the closer you can get them to really simulating the experience of what they're teaching them. So let's, let's say, for example, you're teaching somebody uh, Bitcoin. If you can teach them and have them really working through the process with these worksheets, with these supplemental materials in a way that simulates the actual experience of like doing a trade as much as possible. Of course, you know, when you're teaching them something like that, you want to be careful and not have them actually investing their money yet until, you know, they're ready to go out and do that on their own. But when you have them doing really getting as close to simulation as possible, that is when they learn the best. And that is uh, one, definitely one of the biggest aspects of uh, the course. It's not just the videos that we record, it's not just a Facebook group, but really getting them as close to simulating the process they're gonna be going through out there in the real world, but in a comfortable, safe space. That's what we like to create. Okay. So it uh, sounds like there are a lot of components to, to make this work, and I guess there are a lot of uh, different variations depending upon the business and the results that you're looking for. Uh, yes, but, but, absolutely. But one question I have, too, is um, so maybe if you were uh, taking a longer-term approach or maybe more of a coaching situation where uh, this was going to be – you know, perpetual, it's not just going to be a, a certain length or you don't have a certain criteria that you're teaching. Do you want to invite other guest speakers? Is that, because um, I've heard both ways. I've heard that sometimes it's good to, uh, you know, you keep your audience and you keep them engaged with yourself. Some, and I've heard other people say, well, people get tired of hearing you and what you have to say, that it's good to you know, at invite a guest speaker every now and then and not, not to let them dominate the uh, group or, you know, the time period in which you have together, but just to provide some either added value or extra insight. Yeah, absolutely. I really, I, I do recommend guest speakers. That's completely up to uh, the expert that I work with. That's completely up to them uh, if they want to bring on guest speakers. But I do think that it adds it adds a lot of kind of texture, if that makes sense to the course. It really adds some different perspectives on what you're teaching. Uh, like I said, going back to the Bitcoin example, uh, let's say you've got, you know, one, one big question I know that I've heard because I've had people, <laughs> the people messaging me asking me if I invest in Bitcoin. Um, it, people asking, well, what's the difference between Bitcoin and stocks? I certainly don't know that. That's a question I'd love to know. Or, you know, have people jumped the rails from, the stock market to Bitcoin. So what may be a good idea is to maybe have somebody who did that, maybe somebody who was experienced in the stock market but then decided Bitcoin was a better opportunity, um, or having somebody come on who understands um, securities. Securities are a big thing uh, in the financial world, uh, and you have to be very careful about making sure you don't promise any securities because uh, the Securities Commission of the United States is not shy about putting people in jail for that. So having somebody come on who's experienced in securities, financial law, those kinds of things, those are very important. And, and the thing is, people feel when they're doing a, any kind of course or high-level course, 
they have to know every answer to every aspect of what they're teaching. That's actually not true. If you're not an attorney, you don't need to, to answer questions like an attorney. In fact, it's better not to. Uh, you can bring an attorney on who can answer those questions to the best of their capabilities. Uh, and of course, some restrictions will apply to so just the attorney only practices in one particular state. They may not be able to answer questions uh, about other states, but they can certainly tell you where to turn. So that's a really important thing is to make sure it's okay not to be the the be all end all expert of what you're doing. It, it's completely fine. And in fact, you're probably not because if you're in any kind of space that makes money in uh, online courses or um, just the coaching space, uh, you you most likely will not be uh, in what we call uh, blue water. So the blue water, red water is what we use in marketing. Um, in blue water, that basically means there's no sharks. It means it's pretty empty. And that's where people do some very unique uh, niches. Like uh, I have a friend who has made a very successful business teaching photographers how to do boudoir photography. Boudoir photography is uh, mostly for women uh, in their lingerie when they want something to be more self-empowering, when they're looking for that kind of thing. It's very popular around wedding time as well. And it's a very specific niche. But then you have people... Uh, like me in digital marketing, that's a very red water area. There's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of sharks. So most likely if you're in a space that is already populated, that's good because there's gonna be, that means that there is a lot of need for it. There's a lot of demand. That means you're gonna have a lot of opportunity to talk to people. It's okay if you're in a blue water situation and you know, you just need to make sure that you do your adequate research and make sure that it's successful. I prefer red water because then I know I've always got students. I've always got people who need my services. Like I work with businesses to help them create products. That's very red water. And I, but I know I've always got people. There's always going to be business coaches who are tired and want my help. I'll never run out of, I'll never run out of prospects. Right, exactly. I just have to talk to them. So yeah, I definitely guest speakers, incredibly important. I highly recommend them. If you can't find any, that's okay. But don't feel like you have to be, like I said, the, the ultimate guru of your area because you're probably not. And that's fine. People aren't here, – here's, okay, so here's a secret I'll tell you. People are not buying courses uh, because they think that you're the expert. They're buying the courses because they like you. They like the way you do it. They know you're not the only way of doing it. There's many, many ways of, let's say, buying a car. There's the, People have different techniques for how to negotiate with a dealership. But the reason that they're going with you is because they like you. Right, right. That's the important thing. Yeah, and that is a that big... Is, that is the huge thing. That is a big key to remember is that, you know, you, you can buy a car anywhere, but people buy from you because they like you and they trust you. So uh, I guess the same applies to... To other types of information that we're putting out there as well. So uh, this is kind of a two-part question on time. So the first part is, so how long does it take you to set up the, uh, to set this whole process up, you know, from start to end? And then I assume because I'm the subject matter expert on, on what I'm trying to develop that there's going to be uh, some time commitment and some input that's going to be necessary for me to help you complete the task. Right. So for any, for any mastermind, we're looking at between bare minimum, we're looking at three months to most likely closer to six months to create the product. Uh, and the reason for that is because we do it in, in certain stages. Uh, we do market research to start off with. We're talking to your audience. Uh, making sure we understand what they really want. Then we're testing it with a first run group. Um, they get in at a discount and we work with them and uh, make sure that they're understanding everything. They tell us, uh, they give us lots of feedback. Uh, and then we finalize the product and then we, we clean up. If we need to re-record something, then we take the time to do that. Um, and then we go to the final launch in marketing. So all of that, it, it sounds very quick and fast. It's not. <laughs> Uh, it takes close to six months to complete the entire thing. But the great thing about that is after it's done, the only time you have to invest in the program anymore 
is really the, the weekly calls you do with your students. And, and let's say if you're in an industry that, uh, that can have regulations change, financial regulations, that kind of thing, uh, then you may need to go and update some of that information as well. But overall, it should be pretty, pretty self-running at that point. It should just be able to, to run itself once we, once we finish the process. Okay. And, and that, um, I think you actually answered the second part. The second part of the question was going <laughs> to be, uh, you know, how long, if, if we started doing this today, how long would it be before I could start actually, you know, seeing results? But it, it sounds like it's kind of, um, uh, you start out, you tweak it, you, come back again with another version or added and then so it, it sounds like that it's just building not only the program but the audience and the results for the client as you walk through the six-month process yeah that that's exactly it so really over that six months where we're not just you know we're not just building code we're not just setting up a pretty place for your videos to go uh, we are working with you on marketing strategies where uh, really getting into the nuances of your industry uh, because I certainly am not an expert in your industry. You are. <laughs> and uh, we are also working on content. Content is what can take the longest. And the thing is, we, uh, we really don't need anything fancy. People think they have to have the biggest and best slideshows, lots of animations, you know, incredibly beautiful artwork. Well, that, a lot of that takes time. And I'll be honest, most students don't. At the end of the course, they don't go, wow, do you know what I loved most about this course was the slides. What they mostly care about is, wow, you know what I love most about this course? I was able to close on my first house and, you know, I made $5,000 or, man, I just got to trade Bitcoin and I just made $2,000 on my first one and it's amazing. Those are the things they care about, that they learned something, implemented it, and they won. They could not care less about the design. So I really recommend in order to cut things down, we don't worry, too, we're not worrying too much about the technical side. So as long as you have a microphone that you can be understood, that's great. Uh, as long as you have a decent uh, camera or webcam, that's great. Uh, and the slides can be as simple as a white background with black text. That's the easiest way to read them. Uh, and if we need to show imagery, that's completely fine. I don't recommend that we go incredibly fancy on anything because it just takes more time to design and that's something that can be done in the final stage if you decide okay i really want to have this more brand specific fantastic we can do that but that's a final stage thing is when people get very caught up and it's a very common thing i think for businesses is you you should really be spending 80 percent of your time on the 20 percent that's going to make you the most money but then people really get hung up on the the 80 percent that's not going to make the money which is like slide design. <laughs> right, right. So, yeah, we sometimes we get hung up more on the aesthetics than the message, and you know that was something I was gonna say too. Is that uh, I think it's very important, and I, I'm speaking from a, a user standpoint. As I have been to some some groups and some presentations that they um, they have high hopes, and they they tell you about the dream but they don't tell you the steps or they don't really help you through that process and through the journey. It's more about, uh, you know, if, if you do this, you can be very successful and I did this and I'm successful and Joe did it. He's successful. And <coughs> excuse me, they talk about how successful everybody is, but they never really get to the, to the meat and to the nuts and the bolts of, well, if, if I'm starting at zero today, how can I get to that same success? So I, I guess that's important and probably p a big part of your job to work with the subject matter expert to make sure they're they're giving the audience uh, what they need to be happy. Like you said, they need to give them something so at the end they've got results, not just a bunch of pretty slides. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's exactly it. Is you and, and definitely the the in marketing you definitely hear the pitch you know, the pitch in capital letters quite a lot of, you know, don't you want to be able to only work from home for an hour a week and make millions? Well, yeah, duh. But how do you do that? But then people don't reveal, which from a marketing standpoint, I understand you're trying to get people in to your program to understand. But also when you're confused as to how that's possible, that's a problem. It means your audience 
won't understand and they're probably not going to be willing to pay money for something they don't at least understand the concept of. Yeah, yeah, because um, that's what I look at is that, you know, the old saying, if it's too good to be true, it probably isn't. And so I don't necessarily <laughs> want to pay mo- I don't want to pay money to find that out. You know, I need just a little bit of bait to get me down the road to, to you know, say, OK, this guy's got he's got a plan that he can share and, uh, you know, help make me successful or help me to learn more about whatever the subject is. So I think that's important for listeners to remember is to, you know, really get down into the nuts and the bolts so they can help. So on these groups, uh, is there a difference between LinkedIn and Facebook groups? Uh, It seems the most that I see um, are on Facebook. So is there a reason for that? Well, I think really there's just not as much awareness of LinkedIn and what it can do uh, as Facebook. I mean, it also depends on your particular audience. So if you are somebody who, let's say, you show companies how to get into uh, the Fortune 500 levels, you know, you've been at the top for years and now you're showing other companies how to uh, how to maximize their profits so that they can become a Fortune 500, that would probably be a LinkedIn area because LinkedIn is really meant for professionals to professionals. So it's a business to business area versus business consumer, which is more where Facebook works. Now, for example, if you're somebody who is teaching, um, let's say you're, you're teaching people who, let's say, have a low, low thyroid, how to lose weight effectively, that would be a Facebook area, I would feel, uh, I would recommend, because that is a business to consumer they're not really looking to make money off of learning how to lose weight from their thyroid. Now, granted, I, I usually put people on Facebook because Facebook is just more well known. Almost everybody, even older people, have Facebook accounts. Um, but that is something that you need to kind of figure out with your own audience. Like if your audience does tend to be older, uh, I think still most of them will have a Facebook account, but not all of them will. So, but they may have a LinkedIn profile because they understand it's good for their business. So that may be where you need to just decide, you know, kind of flat out ask your audience, like, do you guys like Facebook or LinkedIn better? Where do you spend more of your time? Uh, There's something wrong with asking people direct questions. People seem to be very afraid of it. Um, But you can definitely ask your audience. But yeah, there there are differences between LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, LinkedIn, like I said, would definitely be a much higher level business to business. But if you're doing business to consumer, uh, I would stay on Facebook um, because that is the that is where they tend to, to hang out. Um, which, granted, you can still do lots of business to business on Facebook. That's where all of my business uh, groups that I visit the most are. Right. Um, but it really just depends. Everybody's different. Okay. So let's talk about um, I, there. Like I said, there's a, everybody's got a theory on how things work. And, but what I want to get to is. What can I charge for this? I'm a solopreneur, and I have this great, uh, you know, like employee retention is one of my uh, big hot buttons. And so I want to put on a mastermind group for employee retention. I have seen, uh, I don't, I don't want to call it a scheme in a bad way, but I want to call it a scheme as in there's multiple levels that you, uh, you need to offer something free then you need to offer something at a stepped up rate then you need to offer something at kind of more of an of a very high priced rate and then uh, you kind of step your clients up through this uh, up through the different packages is that kind of how you charge and then the the other thing would be uh, what is a typical ticket I guess you know what what could I expect to charge to bring people into my mastermind group that's a that's a fantastic question so what you described is uh what Russell Brunson of ClickFunnels would call a sales ladder so that's where you start somebody with a lead magnet at the very bottom and that's what they get for free and then you slowly get them uh to get comfortable with opening up their credit card um by offering them one product kind of after another. Uh, sometimes it's immediately on a page or they, you know, there's time and then they get, they offer through their email. Um, for what I do with the higher level uh, professionals, um, 
I only do uh, high level products. So for those lower products, uh, it really depends on your industry if you're going to need them. Because again, if you are at a high level business to business, there's you can offer a lead magnet. There's everybody should offer a lead magnet. I believe you know a cheat sheet, a PDF, a mini ebook. But you may not need to be offering seven dollars, ninety seven dollars, two ninety seven courses or mini courses or just these you know little things to try and get people to buy more. If you're looking for a higher ticket, you should really just focus on that. Um, Russ uh, Rufino, uh, he is uh, uh, the head of clients on demand. His his model is based on just focusing on those higher level instead of trying to create what uh, what you described as a full sales funnel. Uh, and that's the model that I prefer only because I like working with higher level clients. You can absolutely build a huge profitable business doing smaller level products leading people up to higher level. I mean, again, ClickFunnels is very successful. I believe that they're grossing $10 million a year at least. Wow. Um, but, you know, but everybody has a different style. doesn't mean one's better than the other. Uh, I just prefer... And the people that I work with are usually looking uh, to kind of focus on those higher levels because the thing is, you may think, oh, well, cool, it'll only take a, a few minutes for me to, to knock out a cheat sheet. That's not true. Uh, again, uh, something that I've experienced with cl uh, clients and products alike is that for some reason, the less you charge, the more work and kind of sometimes the more negative feedback you get on something and the more demanding people can get, which is again, why I like the higher price uh, because at that point you're getting a certain client level of people who are ready and willing to work because they are putting their, you know, their money on the line for this. So. Right. I think um, it gets back to results. If you <clears throat> create a, you know, a free cheat sheet, you might pique somebody's interest, but for the most part, you're probably going to disappoint people because they're, you're not going to have the, the time to create a well-thought-out program or document, you know, for free or for seven ninety five. And so I think you're right. I think you can kind of be shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and as far as the other part of your question, uh, which was about price, so really for when you're working with people um, in a space, even if you have re uh, pre recorded lessons, it, you know, some people kind of get uh, – uh, they get intimidated by the thought of, of charging high. Uh, they get imposter syndrome is a big one. They think, oh, but I'm not, you know, that doesn't seem fair to charge people, you know, a couple thousand dollars for this because I'm not working with them one-on-one. -on -one. Well, that's the point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the point is you need to be okay with, with charging more. So really uh, my clients can be expecting to charge between five to twenty-five thousand dollars per person who enrolls at the end. Now, with our first group that we uh, we work with, kind of our test group, they get a discount because they know that we're building and we're we're going, <clears throat> we're getting this out the same time they are. So it's not refined, it's not pretty, but the final product should be able to net you quite a bit. It should be five to twenty-five thousand dollars because remember, you're still investing a couple hours every week into you know, a group coach setting, you're interacting with them on Facebook, you're making sure your materials are up to date. Um, it's not going to take you clearly as long as if you were taking all these people on one-on-one, -on -one, but you're still investing your time and you have to value your time so that you can give people the best of you. Um, something that I actually learned recently from uh, one of my, one of my marketing friends is you need to charge so that you can eat. And a lot of people seem to forget that. That's one reason I'm not a huge fan of the lower price sales funnels uh, is because that is a quantity. Uh, that's a question of quantity for making your money. You really need a lot of people, $97, to make enough money for you to thrive. Uh, now, if you do your marketing well, absolutely, the sky is the limit. But this is why I prefer higher price products because they're – you're not getting the stress of, okay, how many clients do I have to take on every month to, to meet my bills, pay my team? It's, okay, we signed on three $25,000 clients. Fantastic. Bonuses all around. So we're, that's, that's really what we're looking for is for, to create a less stressful environment, not only in 
what we're using our time for, but also in the finances. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You should be able to charge thousands of dollars uh, for per client between five and $25,000. Once you get over $25,000, you're really looking at something more like an inner circle and inner circles are also becoming a big buzzword in marketing nowadays. And those tend to be extended um, periods of time of mastermind coaching. Uh, sometimes you'll get your own um, individual business coach within the particular program that is a little bit more involved, absolutely doable for anybody, but I recommend people start with, uh, a mastermind or a high ticket course before they decide to jump into the inner circle because you can have people subscribing to that for $25,000 to $100,000 a year. So you need to make sure that you're okay with teaching people for a couple months before you decide you're okay with teaching people on an extended basis for what could be years on end. Okay. Yeah, no, that was my next question is uh, I know – Again, everything is different, but for these, let's just say you have a five thousand uh, dollar ticket course. What would be the expected run um, run range for that? Is that going to be over a couple months? Is it going to be expected to be over a year, or kind of what is that average that the, that something like that would ha go go on for? Um, well, I recommend. Uh, not having uh, this because this is how I was taught, and I absolutely agree. Because I've done, I've done courses that were longer, uh, and it just took longer for people to, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, understand, and and kind of get the gist of what they were being taught. Um, I, I really, really, generally, generally feel like an eight module course is the best way to go. But uh, between four and eight modules, and within those modules, you really want to keep it to between four and eight lessons as well. Um, this is really, really important, uh, really keeping that time frame at a reasonable level so people understand. And also remember, if you're doing something at the five to $25,000 level, the one thing in marketing you always need to remember, uh, based on the sales ladder, ladder is that you can always go up another step and teach people more. So you really need to figure out what is reasonable for you to teach and kind of reveal about how you do things at a certain price point. Because certainly, going back to the lower price examples, you don't want to be giving away your entire business if someone's buying a $97 mini course. Um, but you also don't want to not give them enough if they're buying a five to $25,000 course. You want to make sure that you really help them out. Um, so When you say a module, would that equate to a week, basically? I would say it would be about a week. Now, of course, it always depends on the students themselves. So really, uh, we're looking at about eight weeks okay. uh, to have them finish the mastermind. Now, what I, I recommend is that, you know, you keep them in the Facebook community. They get to keep the materials forever. Uh, and maybe it takes them longer to get through it. But once you get to the point of the masterminds where you've done the final launch, people are pacing themselves. You don't need to walk them through it. Uh, when you're doing your coaching calls, you are just, answering uh, their questions about the material that they've already watched. All the pacing should be done for you simply by virtue of video lessons. Okay. So then you're just doing, uh, if you feel like you really need to go over a concept again on a weekend call, that's fantastic. If you just want to do a big Q&A, you know, like for three or four hours on the weekend, that's great too. Uh, but basically that's just, it's just meant to be once the course is done, the students are pacing themselves doing what they need to do. And they're coming to you for refinement or for real-life examples of how to use these strategies you're showing them. Um, so normally, if a student just goes through a course the way that it's set up, uh, it should be about a week a module, I would say, yeah, is reasonable. But it also depends on what the content is because right. uh, it could take two weeks for a module if there's a lot of videos. Yeah, and I think you kind of answered that question, too, that ne the weekly call is not necessarily – to go over a module or material for that week. Maybe you want to reiterate a concept, but really your weekly meetings are going to be more just to field questions and maybe put some additional information out there. It's not going to yeah. be like a traditional you know, college class where they read and do stuff during the week and then you have a class time on Saturday. It's, it's 
sort of like that, but not where they're going to actually be covering that same material on that call. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. I, I really, I really feel just having a review call is the uh, the better way to go. Now you can do some fun things like uh, on that call if you're like, hey, I've got a guest speaker. You know, we didn't have them in the course, but uh, they finally had the time to come chat with us. That's an awesome thing to do, and that still gives you time to uh, answer questions. Um, there's a lot of little things you can do to add bonus value to your course without having to stress yourself out, without having to come up with huge amounts of material. And and what's going to happen is your students are going to tell you, they're going to be like, you know what, I guess they don't understand why I need a special financial attorney for this as opposed to a regular attorney. Why can't I go to a regular attorney? Great. That's something you should talk about. Right. Um, so yeah, the, the big thing is the conversation between you and your students because your students are going to tell you exactly what they want and exactly what you need to add more value. And as time goes on, you can raise prices based on that value. What you charge today doesn't have to be what you charge tomorrow. Right, right. Um, it's absolutely more value it means more money. That's, that's, how our, that's how our democracy works. Right. So let's talk about, uh, I just have a couple more questions. I know we're running kind of long, but uh, this has been very interesting and very informative uh, for me as well. But uh, so what about the administrative part of this? Uh, because I know if we have a high enough ticket item, you know, we're not going to have to have 100 or 1,000 people uh, sign up to be involved. But when we start, uh, when you start doing learning you know classes or programs like this there you know there's seems to always be some administrative headache like people signing up then they want their money back or you know they get halfway through it and they've got to drop out for family emergency you know there's just all kinds of stuff like that and I don't want to cover each and every incident that could happen but so what kind of time do you feel that you have to devote and, and can that become a nightmare or is there a way to kind of smooth that administration out where you just don't have a lot of headaches? Yeah, um, I really don't think you should be spending uh, a ton of time on that. Once, like I said, once we finish with the product that we create, sign up should just happen. Uh, it should be once you send people to the link, whether you decide to promote it with a webinar or some other way of Facebook Live, um, people should just be able to go sign up and they get access. Uh, that, that system is set up automatically. <clears throat> as far as if something were to happen, you know, somebody had a death in the family or a family emergency of some sort, and they just really can't finish the course and they, they need a refund, uh, well, one thing you need to do is make sure that you have a clear refund policy. And uh, I would highly recommend if you don't already have a team built up uh, that you get some uh, virtual assistants or VAs. Uh, VAs, uh, they don't need to have a lot of technical experience. All they need to be able to do is answer emails. And if they feel that it's something they can't handle or they need uh, your input on something, they can very quickly email you. And it's not a huge expense either. There are uh, amazing virtual assistant agencies that can get you a whole team of them. Or you could go somewhere as easy as Upwork, which is a big freelancing website, and you can hire, um, you know, either inexpensive or very experienced. If you're looking for something more like a full-time secretary, um, there's plenty of places you can go. So the administration, the administrative part, I would take off your shoulders as soon as possible because you need to be focusing on your students and the content. Of course, if there's something that really needs to be coming to your attention. Uh, you make sure that you get good, competent people, and they'll let you know as soon as they there's something they can't handle themselves. But you really want to make sure you have your system set up where you have people taking over the things. That, again, this is the 80-20 rule. You need to spend your 80% of your time on the 20% that makes you money. And uh, going in and trying to fix technical glitches or emailing uh, your host company for issues or going back and forth with a student who just really, really wants a refund. That's not something that's really making you money at that point in time. You need to hand that off to somebody else. So make sure that you have a team built up. Um, make sure that you trust them. They completely understand what they're doing. And again, they don't need technical skills. You can absolutely find some if you really want to get some VAs who can very quickly and easily go into whatever program you use uh, for things like your customer's relation manager, your CRM, or your email manager 
or where you're holding your course, your Facebook. If you want people with those specialized skills, you can find them anywhere as well. And again, doesn't need to break the bank. And that cost really should be incorporated into the price of your course. Uh, really, you need to make sure that you're pricing your course in a way that's covering your expenses, allowing for growth and profit. Um, so these, these expenses should very easily be taken care of. You shouldn't be having to, to pull food out of your own mouth to, to take care of it. And you can keep yourself less stressed as well. Right, and I'll put in a plug for um, Upwork and a VA because um, I guess about six months ago I hired one through there, and she has just been a blessing. Not only is she, you know, she's smart, but it's scalable. If I only need her for a few hours this week, she, uh, you know, I don't have to pay a full-time secretary rate, or if I have to use her more hours, then, you know, I'm billed accordingly, and you can really find some talented people, and I, there's a lot of other services. This isn't a commercial for Upwork, but uh, I, I think you're right. You can find a lot of talented people out there to kind of help you get things off the ground. So, but the, I think my concern about this is, uh, here again, looking through my personal eyes, is that if I gave you $50 for something and it didn't work out, or I, you know, maybe you're doing what you're doing and I'm just not feeling the value, it, it's a lot easier to walk away and be done, you know, for $5,000 or above. I, my, you know, what I just, it kind of made me cringe a little bit just thinking, oh my gosh, is it going to be, um, you know, is it, are, are you going to be under a bigger microscope or a lot more scrutiny? just because of the uh, the amount of money that's involved. And I guess it could probably work just the opposite. If, you, uh, if you're charging a high enough ticket, you're, cr you're probably uh, attracting educated, dedicated professionals that really, really want to learn what you're teaching versus somebody, uh, you know, like me that Maybe I saw underwater basket weaving and it was 25 bucks, so I threw it out there and then it's like, well, it's really not what I wanted to do. So maybe it, it might actually work in reverse of what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I could, and I, I've heard a lot of people say that. They're like, oh, but that seems like there's so much stress on that. Honestly, I the, the stress to me gets put on the students because as long as you, what you're teaching, you've done it, you've lived it, you uh, clearly know about it. And I've seen people try and teach stuff that they have no idea what they're doing. Um, they're the epitome of if you can't do teach. Uh, and those are not the people that you want to be. Those are not the people you want to be following. You want to follow the people who are like, if you can do it, then you do it a lot and then you teach it. It's not as catchy, but you know what it works. Um, so really for me, kind of the, the burden of pressure really comes down to the student because the instructor uh, once we're done, you know, we've got students who have succeeded. We don't stop until uh, they are happy and they are satisfied. And the thing is, of course, as people don't realize is you're going to any course, it doesn't matter how talented and amazing you are. Courses are, you're going to lose 70% of your students to just not wanting to do anything because everything in life takes effort and we just happen to live in a time and place where doing things with effort seems to be a novelty now instead of the norm. So you're going to lose 70% of your students. Uh, it's not that they're just going to all demand refunds. They're just not going to bother. Um, they're not going to bother doing the work. They're not going to bother doing anything, but that's okay uh, because you didn't force them to pay for the course. And just because they can't see the value of doing anything, that's not on you. That's not the fault of your course. That is the student students just not going to bother well that's on them and again if they want a refund that's why i recommend having a very clear refund policy because you will get some people who will you know they'll be like oh yeah i'm totally going to do this and like the next day they're like no i'm not going to do this and you know i just i just want my money back because all of a sudden all four of my my mercedes benzes just broke at the same time it was weird right. so i need that money for that and you're like, cool, did you look at our refund policy? Because it clearly states what you have to do if you want a refund. So um, that's just definitely one of the big things. But uh, yeah, I, for higher, once you're in the higher price point, you are going to get people because they are willing to put this money down. They're also saying, I'm willing to do the work. If you don't, 
that's on them. They, they're they the only ones who have wasted their money. You absolutely didn't. And again, this is imposter syndrome is such a, a prevalent thing in, in any marketing space. As long as you know that you are fantastic at what you do, that's all that matters. And you know that you are teaching it and people are loving it, great. If some people don't, that's okay. That's why we have these systems set up for those people who aren't happy. And you know, we make sure that the people who are willing to work and succeed, that they do. Right. Um, but, yeah, so the pressure for me, it, it's more on the students. The students need to make sure they're doing the work. Um, and the instructors just need to make sure they're going to – the only pressure I would see is just making sure your information is up to date. Uh, for example, uh, I heard Dodd-Frank, which is a, a real estate uh, regulation, just got struck down. So I know there's some people out there who uh, might have been talking about that in their stuff, and now they're going to have to go back and – uh, revise it a little bit. So just making sure your information's up to date and that your strategies are still working in the marketplace. As long as all that is working in together, no, it's on the students to make sure that they succeed. It's not the instructors. Uh, we're teachers. We're not babysitters. Right, right. Yeah, and that's fair enough. So uh, we, you did mention webinar earlier, and I think I, I just want to cover this not only from my point of view, but for the audience as well, is that there are a lot of different ways to reach out to people. You know, the traditional email, we have webinars, we have just traditional static groups either on Facebook and LinkedIn. And where I think that this, uh, these mastermind groups adds value, I don't, I don't think it, um, and I'm going to let you tell me, you know, if I'm wrong in this thinking. I don't think it replaces any of these other components. I think these other components actually support it through kind of like, you know, regular marketing channels. You're going to want to do email blasts to advertise it. You'll do email blasts to, you know, keep people informed on what's going on. But then, you know, maybe you want to do a webinar to generate some interest. And then uh, the... Uh, the value over the mastermind versus just a static Facebook group is going to be where not only do we have this course material that we are going to introduce, but we are also going to be more interactive with our audience in this group. Is is that kind of on target? Yeah, absolutely. The, the mastermind course, yeah, like you said, it doesn't replace these other marketing channels. In fact, those marketing channels are critical to getting uh, enrollment into your course. So, uh, like you said, the Facebook groups, uh, if you, which I highly recommend everybody in a business have a, have a Facebook group or at least a LinkedIn group. You have good engagement in your Facebook or LinkedIn group. It's just as easy as posting and saying, hey, we're opening up this new course, and the people who love you and love everything you have to say, they're going to sign up immediately. That's free advertising. Um, you know, and then emails are very important, uh, especially if you haven't, um, if you have new people, let's say you've already got some marketing set up and you've got people taking a free cheat sheet. Those emails that you send are, are incredibly important to make sure that people understand who you are, what you do, and get them to like you. And people don't, don't really underestimate how important it is for your audience to like you, not just the things you're teaching, but you as a person. Right. Because you represent this company with your face, and that's really important to to kind of focus on is make sure that you're really building that rapport between you and the audience. Right. Um, so yeah, the email blasts are, are, and again, that's that's a very low cost way of getting enrollment as well. When you have an established list and you've got good open rates, um, and it's it's getting um, you're getting new people in on a good regular basis. You know, that an email list is gold. Um, and as far as uh, the webinar, for some reason, psychologically, people are happy to sit for an hour and a half if it's called a webinar. If you were to say, hey, come check out this hour and a half of me talking to you or talking at you, people wouldn't be interested. But if you call it a webinar, magically, they're like, ooh, I'm going to get some free info that's going to make me super rich. So people really love webinars, and they're willing to sit there. And you really need to spend more time talking to people when you are wanting to do a higher price point. You could probably sell a $97 course with, like, one email and just be like, hey, here's a $97 course that does this. 
and maybe here's a couple bonuses that get involved with it. But when you're doing something higher level, you really want to make sure, and some people may be coming into your high level course, they may be cold traffic. Um, hot traffic is always best, people who already know and love you, but there's no reason you can't make money off cold traffic as well. So you need to spend that time also making sure that people start to like you. By the hour and a half, that's that's long enough for people to decide if they like you or not. Right. Uh, honestly, seven minutes is probably long <laughs> enough to decide if people like you or not. Right. Um, so yeah, the webinar is, uh, is definitely a huge part of it, just the webinar. And what we do for enrollment, depending on your business and how you like to do it, one way that we can, uh, kind of going back to an earlier question, one way we can keep the tire kickers away, uh, people who will sign up and then maybe not do anything, is an application process. So people have to fill out an application and then they have to get on the phone with you and then you have to be okay with taking them on as a client, um, oh, as a student. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, that's, that's a huge one. Uh, and it's done by a lot of companies because you have to make sure uh, somebody may have the money and to do that, and that's great, but it's different between somebody who's ready and willing to work and has the money and somebody who has the money who is just looking for a, a get-rich-quick scheme or, you know, if it's their last $5,000 to their name and they're about to get evicted, you don't want to take their money. They need that money, and they may be even trying to make a terrible choice right now, but that doesn't mean you need to help them. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, Beth, I certainly do appreciate uh, your time. I know we've talked a lot longer than uh, we had originally wanted to, but it's such great information, so I appreciate you giving of your time generously. Uh, so is there anything else that you know, you'd know you like to share before we go? And then also please be sure and let everybody know how that they can get in touch with you to talk to you about setting up a mastermind group for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I can always be reached. I will just go ahead and give you guys my direct phone number. Um, it is 386-965-2094. And you give me a call there. If I don't answer, leave me a message, uh, and I will give you a call back. I prefer to talk on the phone one-on-one -on -one with people as opposed to going through email uh, because then I can really hear what you're all about and your passion uh, for what you're wanting to teach. So that's the way that I prefer to be contacted. Wow. That's uh, so cool. And then after that, we'll see where we go from there. That's pretty amazing. Old school talking on the phone. People have, people have, I know, right? <laughs> I no thought texting. I, was, I, I mean, if you, if you one. really, if you can't talk for some reason, you can absolutely text me, but I would, I, I definitely prefer the phone call. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm just teasing you because I'm that way. I would <laughs> rather, uh, pick up the phone and call and not have any uncertainties, but, uh, Nowadays, it's hard to find people that don't want to do everything over email. So I, I think that's good. <laughs> I think it's good because you can you get a better feel for them and a better feel for their business and exactly what they're looking for. So that's great. And I will be sure and put all of that in the show notes. So, Beth, again, thank you so much. Uh, listeners, thanks for listening again to the Business of Business podcast. And don't forget to uh, download us and uh, rate the program. Remember, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play, at also at www.thebusinessofbusinesspodcast. You can also check out our sister podcast, which is the Senior Living Sales and Marketing at www.seniorlivingsalesandmarketing.com. It is focused on the sales and marketing process for uh, senior living operators. And then you can also check me out Roy Barker at RoyBarker.com for my advisory and consulting services it's been great again until next time thank you very much and have a great weekend